Tiger Woods was in the stump. And he decided that because his father was a Green Beret, he'd sign up for military training. Green Berets don't accept that kind of stuff. No civilians. So he went for three days to SEAL training, okay? Because he's a celebrity. So he went through the Playboy course of SEAL training. <laughs> you know, give me a break. And came out with this steely gaze. And evidently it was really intimidating for several years with that military background. Three days of SEAL training. First of all, there's nothing like Green Berets. Green Berets are the top. I went through that. I've got wounds to show for it. But you don't go through that three days. It's a mental attitude that I convey to people. And I do it through stuff like adversity training. If it's raining out, go play. If your ball's in the fairway, kick it into the rough and get tough. Hi, this is William Urquhart from Punta Gorda, Florida. And I play out at Twin Isles Golf and Country Club, also in Punta Gorda, Florida. This is Golf Smarter number 939. The best players in the world also make unforced mental mistakes with Dr. Don Green. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter podcast, Dr. Green. Hello, Fred. It is. I've had other Freds on the show, but this is the first time with a green with three E's. Woohoo! <laughs> Kindred spirits. But um, okay, now that we've we've put in Doctor Green, we'll we'll call you Don from here on out. Great. But we want everyone to know um, that uh, you came highly recommended. I was so flattered that Rick Sessinghouse wrote to me and said, "You've got to have Don Green on your show." I have great respect for Rick. So that's nice to hear. As do we. He is a very great guy and a great teacher. Yes. So my um, my research shows that you didn't really start with sports um, on this. It it was a lot of uh, performers. Am I going in the right direction here? No, actually, I did start with sports. And then I did start. Then I got into working with performing artists after that. Oh, yeah. And the similarities, where did you find the similarities between the two? They're immense. They're immense because I come out of a competitive background. I was a springboard diver. Oh, wow. And then I was with the Olympic diving team and then Olympic swimming team and other other Olympic teams is how I got into golf uh, because I didn't start out in golf. But after that, uh, I started working with performing artists who were auditioning for big big roles in orchestras or opera roles. And I found out that they were very talented musicians. They were loving, kind people, but they didn't have a competitive background. Sure. So when they got into a competitive situation, namely an audition <clears throat> of going against a, a number of other talented trained musicians, they tended to fold, choke like big dogs. And when I started teaching them competitive skills, they started winning everything. Wow. Uh, the, the first example was uh, when I was working with a lot of athletes in Northern California, track and field, football, swimming, diving, all the competitive sports, <clears throat> contacted by a, a music teacher in New York uh, who wanted me to work with four of her students. There was a big audition coming up for French horn, and it was one position with the Metropolitan Opera, which is the top paid orchestra in the whole world. And they had one position opening and uh, 250 people sent in recordings to the Met. Wow. The very established recordings laid down with the, with the repertoire and all the challenging songs. And of those people, the Met accepted 59 people to come to New York to play for the audition. This teacher contacted me about working with four of her students. I knew nothing about the French horn. I didn't know the difference between a French horn and a trumpet. Uh, (laughs) Other than it's a very challenging instrument that I came to know. Well, I worked with these four women. I met with them. I gave them one of my assessments that I used with competitive athletes about how they perform under pressure. And they made it work for them. I met with them and I designed a program for each of them separate program preparing for this like it was the Olympics. 
So they had the audition, and those four women of the 59 came in first, second, fourth, and fifth. Hmm. And that's when the Congrats. president of Juilliard wanted to meet with me to see if I could teach <laughs> his students how to be competitive. Sure. And that's when I switched over and started teaching at Juilliard, but teaching the same strategies that I taught to competitive athletes. But since very few musicians came out of the competitive background, my people won everything. And that's that's what I did for many years. Oh, that's so fascinating. So I, I'm... <laughs> Okay, I'll admit it. My wife and I are junkies for American Idol, and we have been for a number of years. Okay, I've admitted it. It's out in public now. But what's fascinating to me is these kids come in and audition for this, and it's doing what they've always done, which is they sing their song. Now, granted, they're singing it in front of three very prominent, um, high-profile musicians who you know, who they, they shudder at when they see, when they walk in the room. But when it gets to the next level, then they're actually competing against other singers. Right. And they're not prepared for no. that. It's clear that they're like, <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm a singer. I'm not a competitor. And they keep saying, no, no, no. Yes, you are. This is a competition. <laughs> right. This is a competition. So you got to be prepared to bring your best game at all times. And they, they haven't been trained to do that. At all. No. And a lot of them haven't been trained to sing. I mean, it's, it's well, that that as well. <laughs> right, but when you're getting <laughs> but, but you I get to Juilliard work with opera singers, and you can't get away with anything. I mean, that's that's a different game. That's totally different. And and that's why I, why I love opera, and I came to love opera mm-hmm. because of that. Oh wow! It's it's hanging it out on the line. I mean, it's it's going for a home run every every time, and it's tough stuff. So what's interesting about golf is that mostly, even at the highest levels, you're just competing against yourself. Exactly. It's not it's not a one-on-one, mano a mano type of situation. You've just got to play your best game. That's it. And, That's and it. let everything else just go where it goes. Which is the difference between boxing and golf. Boxing, okay. Boxing, Among you other can't things. throw the other guy unless you want to get hurt. But you yeah, right. the golf in a bubble. And and that suits some players, but a lot of players, e- even in golf, their approach to competition is not ideal. Yeah, I I'm, I'm, I bounce all over the place, and I just want to know: you were a competitive diver. Yes. Springboard. Springboard. Is that you said? On platform too. Yeah, I was Division One. Yeah. Oh, so you were at three meter, five, ten, six, meter. ten meter, ten. right? Yeah, yeah. Ten meter boards. Yeah. And at what level did you get to? My my brother did that in high school, so we were. I was I was in the top five nationally all four years of high school. Wow, where was that? Where Brooklyn? I went. I grew up in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, yeah. Oh, well, there's not a lot of swimming going on. Well, at least not in the diving. Top school, all four years in the city Catholic high schools, Um, and then I and then I got an athletic appointment to West Point, based on my diving. That's how. And I dove at West Point. And how did you get involved with the PGA? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I had I had played some golf with my uncles in college, but nothing to talk of. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I was with the Olympic diving team in Southern California. And after our team won the Olympics, uh, a real estate developer in Florida, Southern Florida, said, bring the team out here. I want to support our American team. Swimming dive. What year was this? This is 84, 84, 85. The 84 Olympics in Los Angeles. Exactly. I went to the diving competition there. Saw Greg Luganis. That was my team. That was who I was with. Okay. I thought we would look familiar. (laughs) But I mean, we, we dominated, but, but he was inspired by that and contacted Ron O'Brien, the diving coach, and the swimming coach said, if you come here, I'll build the pool for you. I'll build the pool. Okay? Wow. And he did. He did. So we moved to southern Florida, to Boca Raton, Florida. Okay? And we had nothing to do, et cetera. And and somebody said, uh, you need to meet Peter Costas. He's, He's a big fan of the Olympics. So oh, wow. Peter came out to the pool, 
and watched the divers, the platform divers. And he basically said, you teach me sports psychology, I'll teach you golf. Wow. That's quite an exchange. Yeah. And I didn't realize who he was at the time, but he was. Oh, he was you're like, he was, you teach me golf. golf. Okay. <laughs> And I was a bachelor. I knew nobody in South Florida. So he would give me a lesson on one on Monday, hour or two lesson. Oh, as soon as I met him, as soon as he said, I'll teach you golf, you teach me sports psychology. He measured me that day for ping irons. He gave me a fairway wood, gave me a wedge, gave me a putter, started giving me lessons. He gave me a lesson on Monday. Monday night, I'd go to the driving range. Tuesday night, I'd go to Wednesday, I'd go back to my say, ready for the next lesson. And then the, my ping clubs came in, and that's all I did. That's all I did. And plus, I started working with some of his players. Okay. So, so I'm a big fan of assessments. I come up with my own questionnaires, assessments I had for, for athletes, I converted them to performing artists, converted them for golfers. Okay. Assessments. So, I, I had him take one of my assessments, which measure focus, distractibility, energy levels, concentration, confidence, mental toughness. He was fascinated by it. Peter, Peter's an engineer. Peter's a left brain, very analytical. Oh, interesting. So, so he was fascinated by the science behind it. Okay. So I gave him, and a profile comes out like this, comes out as a graph. Anyway. So, so he's fascinated by it, and he says, you know, I want my players to take this, okay? Well, it was a week before draft, okay? And all of, his come, all of his players go to St. Andrews for a lesson with Peter of tune-up, okay? So all of these top players he's working with, and he says to these guys, sit down and take the fucking test. Okay. Because <laughs> otherwise, some new guy, you know, Olympic sports psychologist, young, knew nothing about golf. They would have given me the time of day. Peter says, sit down and take the damn test. The guys are Freddie Couples, Tom Kite, Bernhard Langer, Davis Love, Lanny Watkins, Tom Pertzer. <laughs> Twelve. <laughs> And then he has me sit down over the next three days with each guy and go over their profile. Oh, my gosh. That was my introduction into golf. Okay. Oh, my gosh. All right. We're <laughs> going to pick up on that right after this. We need to take a break. We'll be right back. Well, what was it? that got you hooked on golf? Was it the going to the driving range those first couple of days or was it meeting this, like some of the biggest names in the sport well, the week later, that week? Here I was working with the last several years with amateur athletes and a lot of volunteer work. Right. And I realized that there was only one guy in golf at the time, Bob Brutella, and he was having a lot of success. And I saw all these guys are millionaires. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Peter says to me, uh, okay, I want you to work with some of my women, okay? And uh, they were struggling. Uh, they had both been All-American at University of Florida. One had been on tour for nine years and never won. Another one had only won once in nine years. He asked me to work with them. And I worked intensely with them. I didn't work intensely with the 12 guys. They were, they were off to, to do out. But Peter gave me these two women, and they both won. Lori Garvesey oh. won Tucson Open, first tournament ever. Lori Rinker won the Corning Open. And then Peter started giving me more guys, and then introduced me to Golf Digest schools. And I started teaching at Golf Digest schools and writing for the magazine. And that's, that's what I did for six years. That's all I did. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm curious that when you're working um, and you were new to the sport, but it was performance, it was, it was competitive element of it. Um, where, where did you find the common thread between all these high-level players 
when you're just being introduced to the school? No, it, it's all the same to me. It's all yeah. about focus and mental toughness and staying in the mm -hmm. moment and all that. Not many people teach focus. I've got my own approach to it with a athletic background, a martial arts background, and my whole approach to mental toughness. Because to me, golf is this game of mental toughness. It's not easy. You know, the wind's howling. You know, you're three over. You're in a bunker. You know, it, yeah. And and I, I'm a former Green Beret. I, I, I okay. apply that to golf. There's no whining sure. in, in the Green Berets. This is a game of golf. It's toughness. So, so here's right. the thing. Tiger Woods, years ago, was in the stump. And he decided that because his father was a Green Beret, he, he'd sign up for military training. Well, he, Green Berets don't accept that kind of stuff. No civilians. So he went into SEAL training. He, 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 he got accepted for three days of SEAL training, okay? Because he's a celebrity, okay? So he went through the Playboy course of SEAL training. <laughs> you know, give me a break. And came out with this <laughs> steely gaze and evidently was really intimidating for several years with that military background. Okay, with the SEAL, three days of SEAL training. Give me a break, SEAL training. First of all, your SEALs, there's nothing like Green Berets. Green Berets are the top. You ask anybody in the world who's the top, Special Forces Green Beret. I went through that. I've got wounds to show for it, okay? Mm. But you don't go through that in three days. It's a, it's a, it's a mental attitude that I convey to people. And I do it through stuff like adversity training. Namely, if it's raining out, go play. If your ball's in the fairway, kick it into the rough. Yeah, and get tough because it's a game of mental toughness. And on Monday, on Sunday, on the final nine, it's going to show. Every Sunday, it shows. I call it the Sunday shadow show because their shadow shows up and it's like they're an alien playing the last nine holes. You know, they've been, you know, they're eight, eight over, eight, eight under. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, they're five over on the last nine holes. And it's mental weakness because they're not trained to be mentally tough. They're not. They're not military. They're, they went to college, a regular college. They came out to had a good life. Not me. <laughs> well, Green Beret is life and death. Well, and golf is a game. Well, and some, some people, some I guess. But it comes down to it. It's, it's, I agree to like it. It is their life and death. You lose enough cuts, you're off the tour. You're maybe selling real estate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ask their wife. But, it's, ask their wife of its life and death. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that point. Um, and it, do we, as golfers, take ourselves far too seriously? Yes. It's a game. Yeah. And it is serious, but nobody's bleeding. I mean, not. Ah, Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, there's... It's, it can be too serious, of trying too hard, forcing it, and you lose flow. And that's where Rick comes in. Rick, to say, you lose flow, you, you got to be in flow. Right. And the element of flow is perspective of, of seeing the big picture, namely, it is just a game. I, I, I just can imagine um, you dealing with these athletes and they're talking about how tough and blah, blah, blah it is. And, they, you know, they're getting in the way. And you roll. I could just hear your eyes rolling going, you don't know tough. You don't know challenge. You're just hitting a little ball here. You're just jumping off of a, 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 a plank into the water. You're. <laughs> so I, I, was in, I was in Fort Lauderdale with the Olympic timing team. And we were at a practice, with a 10-meter practice one day. And, you know, it's not like standing on a pool deck and looking up. It's quite a ways until you're up there. And then you look down, it's, oh, my God. So, so an opera coach from the Miami Opera asked me if he could bring out two of his studio singers because they were having performance anxiety, okay? And I'd never been to, I'd never <laughs> been to an opera in my life, okay, before I started with opera singers. In fact, as a Green Beret, you don't. Catch green beret. No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't jive together. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, bring them out. So he brings out these two opera singers in the middle of this practice. 
And both of them are overweight. And both of them look like they're afraid of their own shadows. And he introduces them to me. And they're afraid of me and everything else. And they say they're afraid of singing these arias, these pieces. And I'm thinking, <laughs> these women are up there with just bathing suits on. And you could kill yourself on the next dive. Don't talk to me, you know. So the, he says, well, you got to come to a, a practice session with them, okay? And I'd never been to an opera. Never been to and here I am in a studio with these two singers, and he's playing the piano, and I'm standing next to them. And the intent, the power, like, boom, that came out of them, like an explosion without no amplifier. It's like I'm next to a big guitar amp. And I got fascinated with the power of that and how to do that. And then I saw that they're on this edge of fear that they can crack. If they push it just a little bit, they'll crack. If it cracks, it's like dropping a football. It's just black and white. And I saw that they had reason to have fear and anxiety just as much as they were diving off a platform. And once I understood that and how scary it was, that's when I really started clicking and got fascinated and enjoyed working with them as much as I, I worked with I worked with Olympic shot putter, the number two guy in the world. Uh, when you stand next to him, it's like, boom, talk about an explosion. And it was just like opera. And I got fascinated by it. Wow. And started working with the LA Young Artists Program and the Met Young Artists Program because they're struggling with the same thing that athletes struggle with, which is there's no injury involved. It's all about ego loss, embarrassment. Nobody likes to crack a note in opera. You're up there basically naked. But so you, who oh, are you on the first tee? You're naked there. You, you shank this ball. Into the, you can't hide from that. You, <laughs> the sun didn't get in your eyes. Nobody tripped you. You did that to yourself. Oh, we're going to pick that up right after this. You did that to yourself. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, on, you're talking about the first tee. You're exposed. You're naked. But you just got to go play that shot and you just go to the next one. And you got to get over yourself, as we've already said. You just get over yourself. Well, the, but the question um, is, what caused the, that? Un what are the barriers? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, 20 years ago, I stopped doing what I was doing. Well, I kept on, but I, I wanted, I wrote a couple books about this. But I still had a question I couldn't solve. Why do talented, trained, experienced individuals across the range of music, sports, you name it, make unforced errors that they can't explain? And that's the question I went looking for. And it took me 20 years to figure out. But I figured it out. And, then, and please don't make us read the book, which is called Train Your Train Own Hero. Your own hero. <laughs> And Dr. Don Green with three E's. Uh, absolutely. So what did you figure out? How do they make unforced errors at that level? Well, it, it comes what causes the unforced errors, okay? Well, I'm a psychologist, and, I, and I'm trained, and I apply that, okay? But most of it's Freudian psychology, Freud, it, ego, superego, okay? And that doesn't, that doesn't explain unforced errors, okay? It, you've got... Ego, which is sensitive and reputation that's concerned about that, and you got the id and the e, but it doesn't explain unforced errors. Okay. So I went looking outside of that to Carl Jung, J U N G, uh, mm -hmm. a Swiss psychotherapist around the time of Freud. And he was, agreed with Freud for a while until he realized that Freud was obsessed with sex and it's kind of over the top. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and some of the ego defense mechanisms, yeah, to block out reality, and rationalization and denial and all, but it, it really doesn't help me with golfers missing shots, okay, missing fairways. You know, you just hit 100 balls on the range before you went out. Everyone is pure. You shy, you pull the left foot left into the woods. What happened? I was distracted. Yeah, but, yeah, or I choked. Yeah, but wh what caused it? And, right. and Carl Young came up with the answer, okay? And, yeah, 
And people don't necessarily want to hear it. It's hard to swallow. But it has to do with his concept of the personality. Okay. Now, Carl Jung was brilliant. He predicted World War I and World War II. He's the man who came up with the term synchronicity, namely things are connected beyond a level of that word. Okay. So his model of the personality has a persona. Now, persona is our outward mask that we show to the world, our happy face. How are you doing? Everything's fine. Okay. Beyond that, there's a deeper part of our personality, our dark side. Okay, that is not as pleasant to look at, not as happy, kind of, okay. Shakespeare said, this darkness in me I must acknowledge as mine. Billy Joel, the singer, wrote a song called The Stranger. Same concept, the shadow and a dark side of a personality that comes out of early childhood trauma, unresolved things. Nobody grows up perfectly, no. We all grow up with this. So so we keep this shadow buried because it's not pleasant. To look, but it's but it's there. And, and I give the example to musicians, okay? They go into a job where they're playing with an orchestra and the new conductor comes in. Now, conductors can be tricky things. They can be brilliant or idiots, okay? And, and musicians know, okay? But they have, to be, nice. they have to be nice to keep their job, you know, because conductors have power. So you go into the orchestra and you meet the conductor. Hey, how are you doing? It's nice to see you. Good to have you back. You fucking moron. Why didn't you learn how to conduct? That shadow. <laughs> that shadow. Okay? And the shadow is not necessarily happy because it's got a lot of unresolved trauma. Things that happen to it. It's unresolved. And causes conflict. And, and it doesn't necessarily, it wants attention. It wants people to pay attention to it. But most of us just go away and deny it, ignore it. No, no. So like a kid that wants to be seen, it wants your attention. And to me, me, treat me like me, feel. But people don't. So it waits for opportunities to get your attention. Like the first team. Like, oh, what the hell was that? Me, me, me. Go on, go on. With musicians, it happens at the finals at auditions. That they make a statement. What was that? Pay attention to me. Let's resolve this. Conflict. Take some effort. Take some time. Once you do, stop making unforced errors. Not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You have to, and, and, and golf, there's too many variables to win. But, but. Hitting, hitting, a, hitting a ball this much off the center of the club face on a driver is not the wind. It's the shadow you. causing a mistake, mm. making a mistake. And that, to me, is what I watch every Sunday on golf. Two channels now, Live and the PGA. And all I see is on four stairs on Sunday. That they are shaking their head like, what is that? They go to their teacher who says, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had you right in this thought. You did. It, there's no other explanation than that they actually meant the mistake to happen. It's mind-blowing, oh. but nobody else addresses it. There's, I've read all the books on choke and the, you name it. Nobody else has really solved it for golf. Is it solvable? Yeah, that's what I do. You solve it. Yeah. Do you get resistance? Do you get people like you're pointing this out, you're showing them where it is and what's going on? It, it and they're takes, like, nah, it takes, that's not it me. It takes some coaxing, yes. Huh. And they, they have and do you, to. Do you use your Green Beret coaxing? <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, <laughs> they've had enough of that. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've been basically in a closet for the last nine years. First, I wrote the book, and I thought I could do it in a, in a year. It took me five years. It's hard. It's complicated and hard to convince people, okay? Then people said, you know, this, you need a journal to go with the book because it's work. You've got to write this stuff out. So I took six months and wrote a journal, okay? Then people said, you know, people don't read books anymore. You've got to do an audio book, okay? 
So I converted my dining room into a sound studio, professional sound studio. And I became a recording artist. Nine months. The hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, I couldn't use my lecture voice. It blows out the speakers. So I had to convert my voice to my bedroom voice. Okay, folks, take a nice deep breath and relax. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I finished it. And then I, it took me two months to recover from it because I blew out my voice. And I couldn't talk for two months. And then I started teaching more musicians and they were winning everything. And then I thought, you know, I got to get back into golf. I left golf on good terms. I, I had great relationships with a lot of good teachers, uh, so many wonderful teachers. And some of the teachers that I taught with early that were junior teachers at Golf Digest, like Todd Anderson, is now a senior teacher in Florida at a, at a learning center. Uh, one of the writers I wrote with was a young writer at Golf Digest, is now editor-in-chief of Golf Digest. And I, I, well. I don't want to get in touch with him again. I'm basically been in hiding, uh, working only with performing artists, and nothing has changed in golf. In most every other sport, the records are falling. Like the world shot put record just fell over the weekend. Okay, track records are being broken all the time. Swimming records, divers are diving, doing new dives. People are not shooting in the 55 range. The equipment is better. Golfers are stronger. They're in better shape. Golf courses are better. Greens are better. Caddies are better. Everything's better. Nothing's changed. The scores stay the same. Why? Unforced errors. People are making more eagles because they're hitting it, you know, landing on par five is because of distance and all that. But they're probably three-putting probably more than ever. Hmm. I'm, I'm writing a series now. I've got, I've got, Four articles right here that I'm writing first time for Golf Digest or whoever. Some with Rick, not. And one's on free putting. Okay. Uh, the, the world's top player, greens and regulation, fairways hit, every stat other than putting, two years in a row, is 141st in putting. I'm writing an article on it. I'm writing, a, I'm writing an article I, I call Caddy Talk. Caddy Talk. Do we have time to explore Good. this? Or you want to take a break? That's what we're going to do. We'll take a break and then let's explore it. We'll be right back. All right, let's continue. Okay. All right. So, Caddy Talk. So, caddy plays a, a very important role, and caddies are more sophisticated, they tend to be better players. There are some tend to be famous, you know, they come on, on TV. Um, yeah. And they play an important role with club selection, win, all of that, okay? However, some of them tend to overdo it, okay? Uh, maybe to keep their jobs, okay? But to me, the, the job of a caddy is, is to give the right information before that player steps into the ball. And I, I think of it as a, like a nine foot circle around the ball. That's the, the zone for the, for the player, okay? And the, the job of the caddy is to enable the player to step in there with a clear idea, the right club, the right information, and then leave them alone, okay? So we have two parts of our brain, a left brain and a right brain, okay? The left brain is analytical, making, uh, well, numbers and words, okay? like 163 yards to the pin, but it's back five yards, but the wind's blowing left to right, the words, but in the practice round, it, 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 all these words, which are really <laughs> important. Words, right, 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 Okay? So, and then the player is filled with these words, but he's got to convert these from left brain to right. In other words, the picture of the shot, the image of the shot, the feel of the shot. Does it feel like 133 or 135? The feel, how does it feel in his hands? All the right brain stuff, no words. Mental quiet. Because in there, they need one idea and mental quiet and no words, no numbers. So they're ready at the shot. Okay, got it. 
say, hey, the wind just picked up. You know, it's playing more like 156 than 158. So maybe it's not an A, maybe it's a six. Now we got back again. So, okay, okay. Oh, and don't pull it left in the water like you did in a practice round. Because the mind <laughs> does not understand the word don't, only the, what comes after the word don't. So don't exactly. pull in the left in the water. The, the image is there. That's uh, And then he hits in the water. The guy says, I told you not to hit in the water. <laughs> but you said put it in the water. <laughs> so I'm going to write this article. I'm going to fend some caddies, and I, I don't care. I love talking to caddies. Well, I love having him on the show. I'd rather, and, and I've said this before. I love. I'd rather talk to caddies than than tour players because tour players are a little bit protected. I mean, professional athletes—they've been burned, so they know how and what to say. Caddies don't care. Yeah. They'll tell stories. Yeah. They love telling stories. And I have caddy. I've caddied at Q School. I've caddied at the Open. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I I know the game. Uh, and again, I, I've been away from it doing this other stuff with professional performers, and nothing's changed in golf. And, and nobody's approaching it from my point of view. And I'm just so glad to be delighted with Rick, who understands it. Rick understands this. He's the only pro I know in golf that understands now my approach to it. And he's totally on board. That's why we're syncing up so well. Yeah, and that's why he wrote to us. He wanted to. He wanted to get you on golf smarter. So you have three books. Is that correct? Train your own hero, fight your fear and win, and performance success and audition success and audition success. But are those two different performance success and audition success are yes. two different ones? Yes. Okay. Uh, but again, the the one for golfers is train your own hero, yeah. and it's got an example in there of Parker McLaughlin, who. When I first worked with him, had never won in college at UCLA. He had wrist surgery when I first met him, couldn't hit a ball. And uh, he won the Reno Tahoe Open. And now he's a short game teacher in Phoenix. Awesome. So what about us, the amateur golfer? We're not at that level. We'll never get at that level. Even the best of us, you know, guy who wins a club championship, still could not compete at that level on the PGA Tour. So let's just talk about the middle handicappers. The, you know, some guys single digit, most everybody else is, you know, hovering around the rest of that. And it's, as we talked about earlier, we're competing against ourselves, our own worst enemy, especially on the golf course. And we give ourselves a whole lot more blame than we do credit. Um, you're, I love how you're nodding with things that I'm saying here. Help us, please. Give us some. Give us some advice. Give us some tips of what it is that we can do to remove not just fear but doubt. Or or do those go hand in hand? Uh, they they do, but they're different quantities. Fear is more an emotion. Okay. And doubt is more a thought. Oh, ooh, like it? Yeah. Explain that, please. Well, again, the, the left brain thought is can I hit the shot, you know, or do I need more club, or I, all of the thoughts, questioning yourself, distrusting yourself. That's different than the emotion of fear, of fear of embarrassment, fear of loss, fear of losing this $2 Nassau. It's a different <laughs> emotion. People try to lump them together, and that's the problem. So it's, it's discriminating those two and putting that into your pre-shot routine Namely, switching from left brain noise or words or doubt into right brain, see the shot, feel the shot, hit the shot. It's, it's as simple as that, but simple is good. And that's the beauty of golf. There's no time limit on it, which can be a problem. Uh, you know, standing over the ball too long or taking too many looks at the hole or the target, which is no good. Uh, and it's getting this routine and flow. And that's, again, where Rick comes in. A routine that keeps you in flow, which is movement. See, the problem with golf is you can get stuck over the ball forever, but it's a movement activity. So I believe in, you know, something's moving and then slight pause and go. Because if you're stuck too long, your brain's going to engage and you're going to start thinking. That's why I see it, feel it, hit it, and get in the flow. And are you a big advocate of pre-shot routine? Oh, yes. 
I spent massive amount of time on pre-shock tea. Really? Yes, was absolutely. Oh. And, and what about post-shot routine? Is there a value in that? Yeah, there's a value in that, in um, getting value out of the shot, hit, hit, hit it right or wrong, not judgment, dis- discriminating, you know, slightly off the face, slightly this, okay? And then the club goes in the bag and so does your thought about it, okay? And you do not carry any emotional forward. I hate to see a head go down. It's like, <clears throat> no, no, do not manifest your emotions. Nobody should be able to feel what you're experiencing. I'm a believer, green beret, absolutely cold, stone cold facial expression. You're not going to see, unless you see a smile, or a smile or appreciate it out of me. You may think that I'm fuming with, with anger, but you'll never see me slam a club. That's, that's wrong. That's a mistake, especially for amateurs. It's not, come on. It's not my this. Yeah. Uh, uh, one one of my golf, listeners. The beauty of golf is once you step in that circle, okay, it's your show. And whether you hit a good shot or a bad shot, that's up to you. And at the end of the day, you need to take value in that in, in yourself, in winning over yourself. And that to me is an example that golf can do whether you're playing in the PGA or just with a bunch of buddies with your reputation or your online. When I started working on Wall Street years ago, because I started working with senior traders at Merrill Lynch, this is in my book, and the senior trader, the highest paid trader in the world, his only question to me was, can you help me break eight? <laughs> And when I said, but the handicap, you look good, I said, yeah. And he has since shot in, shot in pro-ams a 73 and a 75. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, but how's his work ethic? I mean, did you help him anywhere at all? That yeah. I mean, he just wanted to talk he, about he golf, made, but he, was he vulnerable he, enough to? He gave me his senior traders to work with before 9-11. Yeah. They were in a slump, mm. okay? I knew nothing about Wall Street. I know nothing about trading. I know nothing. I work with his 12 senior tw- traders teaching the same stuff. Their p l went up 21%. Wow. That's when he Amazing. invited me to work with another group of people and another group of people, which is what I did until 9-11. And... I would have been there. It's my last day off after the summer. I would have been there. But I spent the next two months repairing the damage, getting people back on track. And then I moved to Hawaii and I started playing golf again. And that's when somebody introduced me. They had pro at Wailai who introduced me to Parker McLaughlin, who's the kid I worked with. Okay. Tell us how to find you online and uh, how to work with you. Sure. It's trainyourownhero.com. And you can contact me through that. I have an assessment that people can take and feedback and sign up for sessions if they want. It, it works for everything. In my book are examples of people I, I work with, like people that never passed the bar exam, passed the bar exam, competitive dancers. Uh, it works across the board. I just love golf. <laughs> it works really well with golfers. You got hooked, huh? Yeah. Costas got you in. Oh, yeah. He sucked you right in. You just and, got sucked and, in you know, immediately. I, I was such – I traveled on the road with Bob Tosky and Jim Flick, Chuck Cook. They took me in. Yeah. Oh. And, but that would be intimidating for a beginner, wouldn't it? I, I'm not intimidated. You're a Green Beret. Yeah, you're a Green Beret. What do you care? <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating stories, um, uh, easily relatable. Thank you so much, Don. I really enjoyed having this conversation with you today. My pleasure, Fred. Thank you. This is fun. Okay, I've held off long enough. It's time to bring back the best of Golf Smarter from our archives of episodes that are just no longer available on any podcast app. We started doing this in April of 2019, and when I discovered that a huge number of our episodes have disappeared from the cloud. 
But what has been apparent from the earliest days is that because these conversations are evergreen in nature, meaning that they're just as valuable, helpful, insightful, and interesting today as when they were first released, you've been digging in to listen once again. Since 2019, you've known Golf Smarter Mulligans as a separate podcast. But here's what we're going to do differently this time. And I'm sorry I didn't do it earlier. We're still going to dig into the vault every Friday. But from now on, it's right here in your Golf Smarter subscription. There's nothing more you have to do. But as long as you follow Golf Smarter on your favorite podcast app, you'll get two episodes every week, Tuesday and Friday as always, with Tuesday being a new episode and Fridays will be a new old episode. And as we've done for the last couple of years to get you ready for a new golf season, we're bringing back every interview I did with the late Tony Manzoni. And this year, we're releasing an additional episode that we discovered a few months ago that's never been replayed. You've heard me talk about Tony's video of the Lost Fundamental that you can get for free when you become a Golf Smarter Ambassador. But the reason I do this is because without fail, every time we play these episodes with Tony, I get more emails about how his instruction has changed the lives of golfers around the world. So here we go. Two episodes every week, right here on your subscription to Golf Smarter. And speaking of ambassadors, thanks go out to William Urquhart of Punta Gorda, Florida. And like so many of our ambassadors who participated, William chose to receive a free link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental just for telling us where he's from, where he plays, and what episode number this is. If you'd like to choose from three great gifts, write directly to me and I'll send you simple instructions on how to record. Check out today's show notes to find links about each gift you have to choose from. And remember that links to our sponsors and their special offers are also in today's show notes and our blog posts. Please check them out as a way to say thank you for keeping the Golf Smarter Podcast coming week after week. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or Click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.